Hi, how you going? Welcome, hope you're having a fantastic day wherever you are in the world. Hi to my subscribers, trolls, bots and lurkers alike. Welcome. Okay, this is interesting. Uh, Australian Aboriginal religion and mythology um, is just totally unique. So, the Australian Aboriginal religion and mythology is a sacred spirituality which is represented in stories performed by Aboriginal Australians with each of the language groups across Australia in their ceremonies. Aboriginal spirituality includes the dream time, the dreaming, song lines, and Aboriginal oral literature. Aboriginal spirituality often conveys descriptions of each other's local cultural landscape, adding meaning to the whole country's topography. From oral history told by ancestors from some of the earliest recorded history. Most of these spiritualities belong to specific groups but some span the whole continent in one form or another. And their history goes back 55, 60,000 years like they've been here. An Australian linguist, R.M. W. Dixon, recording Aboriginal myths in their oral languages, encountered coincidence between some of the landscape details being told about various myths and scientific discoveries being made about the same landscapes. In case of the Atherton Tableland myths of the origins, myths tell of the origins of Lake Eacham, Lake Barry, and Lake Umaru. Geological research dated the formative volcanic Explosions described by the Aboriginal myth tell us as having to have occurred more than 10,000 years ago. Pollen fossil sampling from the silt which has settled to the bottom of the craters, uh, craters confirm the Aboriginal myth tell a story. When the craters were formed, eucalyptus forests dominated rather than the current wetland tropical forest. Dixon observed from evidence available that the Aboriginal myths regarding to the origin of the crater lakes may be dated back as our creators 10,000 years. Further investigation of the material by the Australian Heritage Commission led to the Creator Lakes myth being listed nationally on the Register of National Estate and included Australia and included within Australia's World Heritage nomination of the wet tropical forest as an unpre uh, unparalleled human record of events dating back to the Pliocene era. Since then, Dixon has assembled a number of similar examples of Australian Aboriginal myths that accurately describe landscapes of ancient past. He particularly noted the numerous myths telling of previous sea levels, including the Port Phillip myth, recorded as told to Robert Russell in 1850, describing Port Phillip Bay as once a dry land and the course of the Yarrow River once being different. Following what was then Karam, Karam Swamp, the Great Barrier Reef coastline myth told to Dixon in Yarrabah, just south of Cairns, telling of a past coastline since flooded, which stood at the edge of the great, current Great Barrier Reef, and naming places now completely submerged after the forest types and trees that once grew there. The Lake Erie myth, recorded by J. W. Gregory in 1906, telling of the deserts of Central Australia as having once been fertile, well-watered plains and the deserts around present Lake Eyre have been one continuous garden. The oral story matches geologists' understanding that there was a wet phase in the early Holocene when the lake would have been had permanent water. Other volcanic eruptions in Australia may also be recorded in Aboriginal myths including Mount Gambier in South Australia in, and Kinanara. Kinara in northern Queensland. The stories enshrined in Aboriginal mythology very, variously, vigorously tell significant truths within each Aboriginal group of local landscape. The effective layer of the whole of the Australian continent's topography with cultural nuance and deeper meaning, and empowers secular audiences with accumulated wisdom and knowledge of the Australian Aboriginal ancestors back to time immemorial. David Horton's Encyclopedia of Australian Aboriginal Aboriginal Australia contains an article on Aboriginal mythology observing a mythic map of Australia would show thousands of craters varying in their importance but all in some way connected with the land. Some emerged at their specific sites and stayed spiritually in that vicinity. Others came from somewhere else and went somewhere else. Many were shape changing, transform transformed from or into human beings or natural species and into natural natural features such as rocks, huh. but 
all left something in their spiritual essence at the places noted in their stories. Australian Aboriginal mythologies have been characterised as one of the as one of the same fragments of Cachalism, a liturgical manual, a history of civilization, a geography textbook, and to a much smaller extent, a manual of the cosmography. Diverse across diversity across a continent. There are 900 distinct Aboriginal groups across Australia, each distinguished by unique names, usually identifying particular languages, dialects or distinctive speech mannerism. Each language was used from original myths, from which the distinctive words and names of Hindu and myths dry, derive. With so many distinct Aboriginal groups, languages, beliefs and practices, scholars cannot attempt to characterise under a single heading the full range of diversity of all myths being variously and continuously told, developed, elaborated, performed and experienced by a group of members across the entire continent. Attempts to represent the different groupings and maps have varied widely. Encyclopedia of Australian Aborigines nevertheless observes, one intriguing figure of the Australian Aboriginal mythology is the mixture of diversity and similarly in myths across the entire continent. Public Education about Aboriginal Perspectives The Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation Booklet Understanding Country formally seeks to introduce non-Indigenous Australians to Aboriginal perspective on the environment, makes the following generalisation about Aboriginal myths and mythologies. They generally describe the journeys of their ancestral beings, often giant animals or people, over what began as a featureless domain. Mountains, rivers, water holes, animals, plant species and other natural cultural resources came into being as results of events which took place during the Dreamtime journeys. Their existence in pre present day landscapes is seen by many indigenous people as confirmation of their creation beliefs. The roots taken by the creator beings in the Dreamtime journey across land and sea link many sacred sites together into a web of Dreamtime tracks crisscrossing the country. Dreamtime tracks can run for hundreds, even thousands of kilometres from desert to coast and may be shared by peoples in countries throughout which the track pass. An anthropological generalisation, Australian anthropologists willing to generalise suggest Aboriginal myths still being performed across Australia by Aboriginal people serve as an important social function against their intended audiences, justifying the received ordering of their daily lives, help shaping people's ideas and assisting to influence others' behaviours. In addition, such performance often continuously incorporates and myth mythologises historical events in the service of these social purposes in otherwise rapidly changing modern world. It is always integral and common that the law, Aboriginal law, is der something derived from ancestral people, dreamings, and is passed down the generations in a continuous line. While entitlements of particular human beings may come and go, the underlying relationships between foundational dreamings and certain landscapes and theory logically eternal. The elements of people to places are usually regarded as strongest when those people enjoy a relationship or identify with one or more dreamings of that place. This is a identity of spirit, a consubstantially rather than a matter of belief. The dreaming pre-exists and persists while its human incarnations are temporary. Aboriginal specialists willing to generalise believe all Australian myths across Australia in combination represented a kind of unwritten oral library within which Aboriginal peoples learn about the world and perceive a partic particularly Aboriginal reality dictated by a concept and values vastly, vastly different from those of Western societies. Aboriginal people learned from their stories that a society must not be human-centred but rather land-centred, otherwise they forget their source and purpose. Humans are prone to explosive behaviour if not consistently reminded they are interconnected with the rest of creation, that they are, as individuals, are only temporal in time, and past and future generations must be included in their perception of their proposed purpose in life. People come and go, but the land and stories about the land stay. 
This is a wisdom that takes lifetimes of listening, observing and experiencing. There is a deep understanding of human nature and the environment. Sights hold feelings which cannot be described in physical terms. Stubble feelings that resonate through the bodies of these people. It's only when talking and being with these people that these feelings can truly be appreciated. This is the entangable rally reality of these people. Australian uh, Aboriginal people observe some places as sacred owing to their central place in mythology of the local people. And some of the sacred sites, um, you know, like it would be men only or women only and they different all kinds of things they would do. They'd tell stories of everything, the land, everything, where it come from. So the Pan-Australian Mythology. In 1926, British anthropologist specialising in Australian Aboriginal ethnology, ethnographic professor Alfred Radcliffe Brown noted many Aboriginal groups widely distributed across Australia continent all appear to share various or a single common myth telling of an unusually powerful, often creative, often dangerous snake or serpent, sometimes enormous size closely associated with rainbows, rain, rivers and deep water holes. Radcliffe Brown coined the term rainbow serpent to describe what he identified to be common recurring myth. Working in the field of various places on the Australian continent, he noted the key character of this myth, the rainbow serpent, is variously named. Can Mare in Billowella, Queensland, Tulin in Mount Isa, Andrian Jin, I can't say that fully, Jinai, Andrew Jinai, Penfeather River, Queensland, Tacken in Maribor, Queensland, Targan in Brisbane, Queensland, Kura in Broken Hill, Worry, Worry, is Riverine in New South Wales, Netty in Utah, Yetta, Wilcania, New South Wales, Mindy, Melbourne, Bunyip, Western Australia, Akru, Flinders Ranges, South Australia, Wogo, Perth, Western Australia, and Wananga Labington, Western Australia, Kadra, Carnarvon, Western Australia, and Noomadri, Kakadu, Northern Territory. I apologise for saying it wrong. This rainbow spirit, serpent. This rainbow serpent is generally and variously identified by those who tell rainbow serpent myths as a snake of enormous size, often living within the deepest waterholes of many of Australian waterways, descended from a larger being visible as a dark streak in the Milky Way. It reveals itself to people in this world as a rainbow as it moves through water and rain, shaping landscapes, naming and singing places, swallowing and sometimes drowning people, strengthening the knowledge with rain-making and healing powers, blighting others with sores, weakness, illness and death. Even Australia's bunyip was identified as the rainbow serpent myth of the kind above. The term coined the term coined by Radcliffe Brown is now commonly used and familiar to broader Australian and international audiences as it is increasingly used by government agencies, museums, art galleries, Aboriginal organisations and the mythic media refer to the Pan-Australian Aboriginal myth specifically and as a shorthand allusion to the Australian Aboriginal mythology generally. The carpet python, one of the forms of the rainbow serpent character, may take in rainbow serpent myths. A number of linguists, anthropologists and others have formally documented another common Aboriginal myth occurring across Australia. Predecessors of myth-tellers accounted a mythical and toxic, most often English, character who arrives from the sea, bringing Western colonialism, either offering gifts to the performer's predecessors or bringing great harm upon the performer's predecessors. This key mythical character is most often named Captain Cook. He wasn't a captain either. This being a mythical character shared with the broader Australian community, who is also attributed James Cook with playing a key role in colonising Australia. The Aboriginal Captain Cook is attributed with bringing British rule to Australia, but his arrival is not celebrated. More often, within the Aboriginal telling, he proves to be a villain. 
many Aboriginal versions of Captain Cook are rarely old recollections of encounters with the Lieutenant James Cook, who first navigated and mapped Australia's east coast on HM Bark and Devo in 1770. Guru Yinama predecessors, along with the Endeavour River, did encounter James Cook during the seven-week period breach at the site of the present town Cooktown while the Endeavour was being repaired. From this time, the Guru Yinama did receive present-day names for places occurring in their local landscape and the Guru Yinama may re recollect this encounter. The Pan-Australian Captain Cook myth, however, tells a generic, largely symbolic British character who arrives from across the ocean sometime after the Aboriginal world was formed and the original social f order founded. This Captain Cook is a harbinger of dramatic transformations in social order, bringing change in a different social order into which present-day audiences have been born. In 1998, Australian anthropologist Cam Kenneth Maddock assembled several versions of this Captain Cook myth as recorded from a number of Aboriginal groups across Australia, included in his assemblage are Batemans Bay, New South Wales. Percy Mumbala told of Captain Cook's arrival on a large ship with anchored at Snapper Island, from which he disembarked to give the myth teller's predecessors clothes to wear and hard biscuits to eat. Then he returned to his ship and sailed away. Mumbrella told how his predecessors rejected Cook's gifts, throwing them into the sea. Cardwell, Queensland, Chloe Gramp and Rosie Runaway told how Captain Cook and his group seemed to stand up out of the sea with white skin of ancestral spirits, returning to their descendants. Captain Cook arrived first offering a pipe and tobacco to smoke, which was dismissed as a burning thing suck in his mouth and then boiling a billy of tea which was dismissed as scalding dirty water <laughs> next baking flour on the coals baking flour which is damper damp it's, yeah damper we call it which was rejected as a smelling stale and thrown away untasted finally boiling beef which smelled well and tasted okay once the salty skin was wiped off Captain Cook and group then left, sailing away to the north, leaving Chloe Grant and Rosie Runaway's predecessors beating the ground with their fists, fearfully sorry to see the spirits of their ancestors depart in that way. The southeastern side of the Gulf of Carpentaria, Queensland, Roy Rolly Gilbert told of how Captain Cook and others sailed the oceans in a boat and decided to come see Australia. Then he there he encountered a couple of Rowley's predecessors whom he first intended to shoot, but instead tricked them into revealing the local population's main camping area, after which they set up the people, the cattle industry, to go down the countryside and shoot people down just like an animal. They left them there laying for hawks and cows. So a lot of old people and young people were struck in the head by the end of a gun and left there. They wanted to get the people wiped out because Europeans in Queensland had to run their stock, horses and cattle. What they did to them was horrible, absolutely horrible. Victoria River. It is told that the Captain Cook saga, the Captain Cook sailed from London to Sydney to acquire land, admiring the country. He landed bullocks and men with firearms, following which local Aboriginal peoples in the Sydney area were massacred. Cook made his way to Darwin, where he sent armed horsemen to hunt down Aboriginal people in the Victoria River country, founding the city of Darwin and giving police plus cattle station managers orders how to sh treat Aboriginal people. In the Kimberley, numerous Aboriginal myth tellers say that Cook is a European culture hero who landed in Australia using gunpowder. He set a precedent for the treatment of the Aboriginal peoples throughout Australia, including the Kimberley. On returning to his home, he claimed that he had not seen any Aboriginal people and advised that the country was vast and an empty land which settlers could come and claim for themselves. In this myth, Cook introduced Cook's Law, upon which the settlers relied.
the Aboriginal people noted, however, that this is a recent and unjust and false law compared to the Aboriginal law. Views on death. The response to death in the Aboriginal religion may seem similar in such some respects to that be found in European traditions, notably in regard to the holding of a ceremony to mark the death of an individual and the observance of a period of mourning for that individual. Any such similarity, however, is at best only superficial, with ceremony and mourning of some kind of being common to most, if not all, human cultures. In death, as in life, Aboriginal spirituality gives pre minutes to the land and sees that the deceased are linked indissolubly by a web of stubble connections to the greater whole. For Aboriginal people, when a person dies, some form of the person's spirit and also their bones go back to the country they were born in. Aboriginal people believe that they share the being with their country and all that is within it. So when a person dies, their country dies, trees die and become sacred because it is believed that they come into being because of the deceased person. When an Aboriginal person dies, the families have death ceremonies called sorry business. During this time, the entire community and family mourns the loss of the person for days. They are expected to cry together, share grief as a community. If someone should be out of town and arrive after the community has held the ceremony for the deceased, then the entire community stops what it is doing, goes to break the news to the latecomer, and then mourns with them. The family of the deceased all stay in their one room and, and mourn for their loved one. Naming a person after they have died is not allowed in Aboriginal religion. To say someone's name after they die would disturb their spirit. Photos of deceased are not allowed for fear of disturbing the spirit also. That's why in Australia um, they'll put up at the start of documentaries saying that they may be deceased or, you know, Aboriginals. You know, they do it on every everything. Many Aboriginal families will not have any photographs of their loved ones after they die. A smoking ceremony is also conducted when someone dies. This community uses smoke on the belongings, also the residents of the deceased, to help release the spirit. Identifying the cause of death is determined by the elders who hold a cultural authority to do so, and causes in question are usually of spiritual nature. The ceremonies are likened to an autopsy of Western practice. Ceremonies are mourning periods last days, weeks, even sometimes months, depending on the social status of the deceased person. It's culturally inappropriate for a non-Aboriginal person to contact and inform the next to kin of a person's passing. When someone passes away, the family of the deceased move out of their house and another family then moves in. Some families will move to sorry camps, which are usually further away. Mourning includes the recitals, symbolic chants, the singing of songs, dance, body paint and cuts on the body of the mourners. The body is placed on a raised platform for several months, covered in native plants. Sometimes a cave or a tree is used instead. When nothing but bones are left, family and friends will scatter them in various variety of ways. They sometimes wrap the bones in hand-knitted fabric and place them in a cave for eventual disintegration or place them in a naturally hollowed out log. Many Aboriginal people believe in a place called the Land of the Dead. This place was also commonly known as Sky World, which is really just the sky. As long as certain rituals were carried out during their life and at the time of their death, the deceased are allowed to enter. The land of the dead in the sky world, the spirit of the dead is also part of different lands and sites, then those areas become sacred sites. This explains why Aboriginal people are very protective of sites they call sacred. And it was really disgusting to see BHP Billiton blow up sacred sites in Western Australia just for iron ore. That was horrible. You know, a place that had been used for tens of thousands of years and they blew it up just for the minerals. Unreal. The rituals that are performed enable the original person to return to the womb of all time, which is dream time. It allows the spirit to be connected once more to all nature, to their ancestors and their own personal meaning and place within the scheme of things. The dream time is a return to the real existence for the Aborigine. Life in time is simply a passing phase 
a gap in eternity. It has a beginning and it has an end. The experience of dream time, whether through rituals or formed dreams, flow through into life into the life in time of practical ways. The individual who enters the dream time feels no separation between themselves and their ancestors. The strengths and the resources of the timeless enter into what is needed in the life of the present. The future is less uncertain because the individual feels their life as a continuum linking past and future in unbroken connection. See, time to them doesn't exist like we have now. It's just they don't see it that way. Through the dream time, the limitations of time and space are overcome. For the Aboriginal people, their relatives are very much part of the continuing life. It is believed that in dreams, dead relatives communicate their presence. At times, they may bring healing if a dreamer is in pain. Death is seen as a part of cycle of life in which one emerges from the dream time through birth and eventually returns to the timeless only to emerge again. It is also a common belief that a person leaves their body during sleep and temporarily enters the dream world, the dream time. There are many song lines which include reference to the stars, planets and our moon. Although the complex systems which go to make up the Australian Aboriginal astronomy also serve practical purposes such as navigation. Man Mala Patha people. His country is saltwater con country immediately inland from the town of Wadeside, Wadeye, Wadeye. Describe a dream time in their myths which anthropologists believe is a religious belief equivalent to, though wholly different from most of the world's other significant religious beliefs. In particular, Scholars suggest that the Minopatha have a oneness of thought, belief and expression unequalled with Christianity as they see all, all aspects of their lives, thoughts and culture as under the continuing influence of their dreaming. Within this Aboriginal religion, no distinction is shown between things spiritual, ideal, mental and things material, nor is there any distinction drawn between things sacred and things profane, Rather, all life is sacred. All conduct, conduct has moral implication and all life's meanings arises out of this eternal, ever-present dreaming. In fact, the isomorphic fit between the natural and the supernatural means that nature is coded and charged by the sacred, while the sacred is everywhere within the physical landscape. Myths and mythic tracks cross over thousands of miles in every particular form and feature of the train as well as its developed story behind it. Animating and sustaining this Maripatha myth is the underlying philosophy of life that has been characterised by Senna as the belief that life is a joyous thing with maggots at its centre. Life is good and benevolent but throughout life's journey, there is numerous painful sufferings that each individual must come to understand and endure as he grows. This is the underlying message repeatedly being told within the Maripatha myths. It is the philosophy that gives the people motive for meaning in life. This myth, for instance, is performed in the ceremonies to initiate young men into adulthood. A woman, Machanga, the old woman, who was in charge of the young children, but instead of watching out for them during their parents' absence, she swallowed them and tried to escape as a giant snake. The people followed her, spearing her, and removing the undigested children for the body. Within this myth and in its performance, young and unadored children must first be swallowed by the ancestral being who transforms into a giant snake, then regurgitated before being accepted as young adults with all the rights and privileges as young adults. Pintupi people. Scholars of the Pintupi people from within Australia's Gibson Desert region believe they have predominantly mythic form of consciousness within which events occur and are explained by their preordained social structures and orders told or sung about and performed within their superhuman mythology rather than by reference to the possible accumulated political actions, decisions and influences of local individuals, i.e. this understanding effectively erases history. 
The dreaming provides a moral authority lying outside the in individual will and outside human creation. Although the dreaming is as an or ordering of the cosmos is presumably a product of historical events, such an origin is denied. These human creators are objectified, thrust out into principles or pre precedents for the immediate world. With it, within this, the Pintupi worldview, three long geological, geographical tracks of name places dominate, being interrelated strings of significant places named and created by mythic characters on their routes throughout the Pintupi desert region during the dreaming. It is a complex mythology of narratives, songs and ceremonies known to the people as Taratingari. It is mostly commonly told and performed by the people in larger gatherings within their country. The newer belief systems. In principle, census information could identify the extent of traditional Aboriginal beliefs compared to their other beliefs such as Christianity. However, the official census in Australia does not include traditional Aboriginal beliefs as a religion and includes Torres Strait Islanders as a separate group of Indigenous Australians in most of the courts, most of the counts. In the 1991 census, almost 74% of Aboriginal respondents identified with Christianity, up from 67% in the 1986 census. The wording of the question changed for the 1991 census, as the religion question is optional. The number of respondents reduced. The 1996 census reported that almost 72% of Aboriginal people practice some form of Christianity and that 16% listed no religion. The 2001 census contained no comparative data. The Aboriginal population also includes a small number of followers of other mainstream religions. So, yeah, it's interesting. Um, I'm going to share a few other ones about these. What what I've seen. See, they talk about all sorts of characters like... Um, Glasshouse Mountains is Mount Tibagaran, and it was supposed to be a, um, it looks like a giant. This is Mount Tibagaran here, this is what this one is, and it's a giant. You see his head, there's his eyes, that's his head, his arm, arm, there's a leg, knee, leg, knee. You used to be able to see the face, but there's a lot of trees on it now. They call it the Glasshouse Mountains, they call it a volcanic plug. But you look at the mythology of the region, Tibagaran was the father of all the Glasshouse Mountains except Biwa, Biwa, his wife. It is said that Tibagaran saw the rising of the waters from the sea and called his son Kunwin to take his mother Biwa to the safe place because she was pregnant with child. However, Kunwan, aka Crooked Neck, failed to do so and in anger, Tibagaran clubbed Kun won and broke his neck. Tibagaran is said to have turned his back to face Kunrin. You can see he's turned. Tibagaran is relatively small compared to the mountains in Queensland and elsewhere. That's where his eyes would have been. You can see he's sitting down all hunched up. This is Mount Biwa and she was pregnant when this happened. And the other ones are the children. I think there was two or three children. Well, that's the female. So this being transformed into a mountain range. He's seeing lying on his back above the barren gorge, river gorge, looking upwards to the skies within northeast Australia's wet tropical forest landscapes. So, and you know, they've even discovered Aboriginal language used all the way up... Um, Tamil, all up in there, Sri Lanka, Fiji, they used to trade and use um, canoes sort of things like that, they, they had, I think they had tech. Anyway, wherever you are in the world, thanks for watching, raise your vibrations, lots of love, bye now.